I am Carolyn Friedlander and welcome back to the um, fifth video for the Pine and Bow Quilt Along. In this video, I'm going to show you my finished projects. I'm super excited. Um, and then I'm also gonna answer some questions from you. So let's get started. All right, first let's take a look at my Pine project. So with my Pine project, uh, last time we checked in on this, I had some of my blocks sewn, but now I have finished nine blocks. And I just kept sewing until I kind of, I just liked this, this row, this, I liked this grouping of three by three. I liked the colors and I was happy with it. So I made nine blocks, laid them out, sewed them together. And after I got them sewed together, I knew I wanted to make a mini quilt that I could hang on the wall. And um, I don't know, there was just something about the shape of it. I liked the idea of making it more square. For me, for borders, um, I think of borders as just giving the block space, um, making the shape or orientation that you want for your project. So for this one, it just felt like, it felt to me like I wanted it to make it a little bit more square. And I liked how, especially with this color, it just kind of gives a little more space to the blocks um, and it gave it the right color. So yeah, so I added two borders on the sides. And then um, one, one of my inspiration photos, um, it was from a trip to a museum and the museum had these like beautiful curved archways. And so I just loved thinking about that shape and I was kind of curious to perhaps incorporate that shape in the quilting. So I made myself a quilt sandwich, just grab some scrap, um, some scrap batting and some scrap fabric. It would have been nice to get a larger piece of fabric <laughs> so that I'd have a larger sandwich, but this is what was nearby and I just really wanted to try. Um, and I should say too, with this project with Pine, I knew that I wanted to do um, free motion quilting. So I wanted to quilt this one by machine. So anyway, here you can see how I just started playing around with this arch shape. Um, and then I was thinking about how the shapes could connect. And then here you can see, I don't know, I just felt like this scale was a little bit big for the size pieces, uh, the size, the scale of the piecing of the blocks. So I started to kind of make it smaller. I also just didn't really like the fussiness of having to hit those points each time. Um, so I was kind of curious if I could separate that shape, make it a little bit more irregular, um, maybe not leave so much of a gap, so much space in each of the, between each of the, the, the lines of quilting. And so I ended up doing, um, and it might be easier to see this from the back and you can see it best on the borders cause I ended up adding more quilting here. Um, but what I did was these little, just kind of like free form zigzags all the way across, back and forth. It was kind of fun. It's like doodling. So as I was going kind of back and forth with the zigzag kind of a thing, what I was noticing is that some of my straight lines were starting to bow a bit. And so I stopped and then I did all of my ditches. So I locked down all of my, uh, I just outlined all of my trees. I wanted to hold those in place. And then I also did my horizontal and vertical lines just to kind of maintain that shape a little bit better. Cause doing that kind of zigzaggy free motion stuff um, can push and pull your fabric a little bit. Um, and I just didn't want that. So. That was what I did. So after doing my like all over zigzaggy kind of thing, I realized I wanted to add another layer. So I just wanted to add a little bit more color. Um, the first pass, I just used like a very neutral gray. So you can't really even see it, but I wondered if I could cast a slight tone through the quilting. And I also wanted to add a little bit of density through the quilting. So I, figured I thought I'd try a few different thread colors. So I can't remember which one I started with. It might've been this block, um, or actually, I don't know. It might've been this one. I used actually a lilac color. Um, it blends in pretty well, but then I tried the, this one, this one, and this one all have a fluorescent yellow, which is really great. So it's a fun detail to see up close. Um, but I don't know how much more color it adds from further away. I guess it adds a little bit, um, but it was fun to play around with that idea. I ended up adding a darker purple. So that's here, a deeper peachy pink. This is an orange. And then finally I did a blue. So this one definitely adds quite a cast. So um, I don't know, it's kind of fun to play around with your quilting. This one, I just really wanted to, it was one of those things where I started with kind of a quilting design I haven't used before. And then I thought about adding more layers with color, with more density. And I just had a really good time exploring that and seeing how it would come out. So um, let's see, I'll 
post a picture of, I did take a picture of this as I was quilting it. So after the first pass, so I'll insert a picture of that here. And then now you can see kind of the final version, how that looks. After getting it quilted, I needed to pick a backing or a binding fabric. Uh, with this project and also with bow, I hadn't chosen a fabric. A lot of times with some of my other projects, I might think about the binding choice. I might go ahead and cut my binding as I'm basting the project. I don't know, but it doesn't always happen. It just depends on the project. So with this one, I didn't know, but I liked using this. It's a cotton lawn from my Friedlander collection. And it's in this like kind of girly pink, it's in kind of this really pretty pink with a bunch of different design motifs on it. And um, one thing that happened that I love that I never could have planned for if I would have planned to make this happen, it never would have happened, but I noticed and was delighted uh, after I sewed on my binding was in this top corner, how these blue lines that are in, printed on the fabric just like perfectly framed this corner of the project. I love it. It is one of my favorite things that happened with this quilt and it was completely accidental. So otherwise, I don't know, I think it's pretty fun. Um, I need to add a label. I do like adding labels to my projects. Not all of my projects have labels, but I like doing it because it reminds me of when I made it. It reminds me of what I made it for. Um, it's just really nice. I'm always grateful when I have labeled a quilt and it has information on there because usually I will forget all of those things. So add a label. So now let's take a look at bow. Last time I shared, uh, I had all of my blocks appliqued, but that was it. So now I needed to lay them out, put them next to each other. I'd also cut all my backgrounds bigger, uh, the intentionally bigger than what they needed to be. So I would need to trim them down. And the reason I did that is just, I wanted more flexibility. I didn't know how I would want to sew them together, um, what I would want to use them for. And so um, giving myself some flexibility there really helped. So I trimmed everything down. I ended up with some nice, pieces here um, that I considered using um, in the layout. You know, I actually thought about rather than doing like a four square like I ended up, I thought about maybe putting these and, you know, using these as a base for each of the blocks and then staggering them. Uh, you know, so maybe like these weren't lining up perfectly, but maybe they were staggered a bit because, you know, and even this could be cool. Ooh. That's kind of neat. <laughs> There's so many things you could do. Uh, I think the more you look at something, the more you can come up with ideas. But anyway, I uh, did end up using these, but I'll save them for something else. Maybe I'll use them to make a quilt label. So anyway, I ended up sewing my blocks together. O originally, I kind of thought about making a pillow sham. I really wanted to make a pillow sham, but I ended up not doing that just because of the size of this motif. I felt like two pieces side by side would kind of wrap around a pillow. And I like, I don't know, I would rather the pillow, they be more contained so that I wouldn't have to worry about part of the rainbow kind of folding into like the side of the pillow, if that makes any sense. Um, so anyway, I just sewed them together in a four patch and I decided I wanted to make another little mini quilt that I can hang on the wall. And it's really funny, like this happens to me pretty often, but um, in this case, after I sewed my four blocks together, I laid uh, the four pieces together on my bed and on my bed, I have a light colored quilt. And there was something about seeing the blocks on the light colored background. I really liked that. So that gave me the idea to add a border. And so with pine, I added the two borders on the side. With this one, for something about it, I just liked the idea of adding strips of fabric to the top and the bottom. Um, and I chose this white, it's a white on white print from my Karkai collection, um, but it looks white. Um, and I liked the crispness, crispness of this next to the blocks. I feel like it just adds some sharpness that's really nice and it frames everything really in a clean way. And then I even included a little scrap of one of the background fabrics here. So I don't know, I think it's pretty fun. So with pine, I knew I wanted to do machine quilting. With this one, I knew I wanted to hand quilt it. And I don't know, maybe it's boring, but like with all of my bow quilts so far, I've hand quilted them. You don't have to hand quilt that project. I should machine quilt one of them. That would be, that would be really fun to see how that would come out. Um, but I knew I wanted to hand quilt. I knew I wanted to add a layer of color. I knew I wanted to play with the texture of this. So I pulled a few different threads to audition, you know, different color directions. So, you know, this one I actually really like, any of these I think would be beautiful on here. 
that's the tough thing. You can audition stuff and fall in love with a million things, but you have to, you know, make a decision ultimately. So this one would have been really beautiful. I've got some variegated options here. This one's a solid, more variegated, and this one, so these are all blue. This one's a fuchsia -y plum berry color, which I think would be beautiful. Um, but I ended up going with this one. And the reason for that is just that one thing I love about this is the bright blue of this fabric and this bright blue. And I just wanted a very saturated color to kind of tie it together and add just a really pretty, a pretty colorful layer um, in the quilting. So that's what I used. And you can see I just quilted diagonal lines and uh, I don't know, it's pretty simple, but it's funny after I, as I was quilting this one, just like with pine, I was getting these urges to continue quilting. And I was like, oh, what about if I did use one of the other colors that I had? Or what if I came in and did machine quilting? I just kept th thinking about new layers of quilting that I wanted to add. And um, I don't know if that happens to you if you think of other ideas as you're doing it, but I really kind of had to tell myself, I could have kept doing that, but what I ultimately did was like, no, let's finish this as is. I have other projects to, to, to move along with and um, I can keep those ideas and try them in a future project. So I cut myself off at this stage, which I think is an important thing to do. I think, you know, it's good to allow yourself to explore um, at times and then at other times, it might be the right thing just to say, you know what, now is a good stopping point too. So let's just stop here. And so that's what I did. And I'm happy with it. Um, and yeah, so for the binding, I hadn't chosen a binding for this. I could have definitely picked out any of the fabrics that are already in this project. The white would have been really nice. Um, but something about when I was cutting the binding, I noticed this fabric, which is from my Jetty collection. Something about the colors, like this limey, citrony green. It's nowhere else in this project, but I liked I don't know, I just liked it. <laughs> so that's what I chose, I bound it, it's kind of fun. It's a super scrappy, I don't know, it's a fun project. So, and then back I have, it's just a piece from my Languid collection. It's pretty simple. I didn't have enough binding to go around, so I added a little piece of this, which is right here. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I like it. So I do have a few takeaways that I wanted to share from these two projects. The first is just how much my mood affects a lot of my choices and just how kind of the context matters so often. So for example, um, even just the fabrics that I was drawn to, you know, the in my pine project, all of those peaches and pinks had to do with traveling and seeing a museum and being excited by that color palette. So who knows what it would have been if I'd have visited somewhere else or hadn't been on that trip, I would have found inspiration somewhere else. And same with this one, you know, um, I think in a lot of ways I had specific fabrics that I was interested in. Um, and those really initi initiated the, the fabric pull and the palette that I put together. But then it's always funny to me too, like once I get a project pieced together, um, how, you know, like with my bow project, when I laid it on my bed uh, and it being on a light background, that really gave me the idea to add these light borders to the top and to the bottom. Um, so it's funny, I, I think that fabric selection and the things that we're drawn to are very, can be very fickle. And um, I don't say that as a bad thing, I say that as like a really, kind of exciting thing and fun thing to embrace. Also with both of these projects, I had a lot of fun with the quilting, exploring new ideas. So with Pine, I was playing around with free motion quilting and having fun with that and layering different colors and adding density with the thread. Uh, with Bo, I brought in a bright color. You know, I'll be honest, I am always surprised by hand quilting and using a thick thread and what the results of that are. Um, sometimes I feel like the darkest threads and the highest contrast are most satisfying. Um, this one, I thought there would probably be a little bit more contrast than there ended up being, but you know, these are the things you learn. And I think that that's why I was drawn to, or I considered adding more colors in the end. Um, but I also like how it ended up. I like the softness. I like that it does add color. I like, um, how the blue looks with the binding. I don't know. There's such a learning process built in and discovery and how colors and shapes and textures work together. So both of these projects are very representative of that for me. Now to answer three questions from you. 
Rebecca, Rebecca asks, uh, could you go over those numbers on the sides of thread spools, meaning and usage? And if you can, how uh, we can tell what size a needle is, like when we use them and try to be careful with them, but then they get mixed up with other needles, then one can't tell which is which size. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. First of all, with needles and not knowing what size they are, um, getting them mixed up after you take them out of the package, I can 100% relate to that. Um, I know that needles, uh, it's, I mean, I guess they vary by manufacturer, but needles have, oh, I guess that's a good, I just, I was thinking machine needles, but hand needles too. So hand, hand sewing, quilting, whatever needles don't have color labels printed on them, but like machine, uh, machine sewing needles do. They have different color coded systems depending on the manufacturer. Um, and they're usually printed on the shaft. So those, you can just like do a Google search and see what those colors mean, what they refer to. Um, so we'll talk about machine first. So, and actually I should show you this. Um, I don't know, I've had this for a few years. It's a needle pack thing. You can put all your needles in here like I have. Mine's not super, it looks more organized than I think it actually is, but here it has all the different like universal, stretch, microtex, whatever. So the different types of needles. And then there are all these different slots based on the size needle. Um, and then some blank ones that I guess you can write in. Um, so this is one way that you could organize your needles. Another way to do it would be with a pin cushion. I know certain people have different pin cushions with different designations. They might use a Sharpie and write in each section what type of needle that is. That might be the best way, um, especially for like hand sewing needles. Um, this is a pin cushion a friend made for me. And I've kind of been using it that way. I've got a machine needle here. Um, I don't know what kind it is actually, so maybe it's not a great system, but um, you could use something like this. Um, in fact, I've got a pin cushion pattern. It's not exactly like this, but you could certainly piece together a panel um, using my crew pin cushion pattern. And you know, the white is sashiko needle, whatever the blue or the red is, whatever type of needle. And you could write that on there or maybe put that code somewhere. But that could be a really good way to organize your needles and then at a glance know what type is what type. As far as thread goes, I grabbed a few different spools that I have around. Um, so these are all from Aurifil. This one is a Guterman Mara thread, which it says that on here. Uh, this is a thread that I like using for garments. On this one, let's see, so it says Guterman Mara 100. Um, so that's the brand, that's the type of thread. Mara, or the 100, I believe this is 100 weight. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but it says 100% polyester. Like I said, I use this for garments, it's very strong. It says made in Germany. Looks like there might be a SKU number, and then it tells you how many yards, how many meters, and then it says a color. So. Um, and it says color 861. So that's referencing the color. Um, so we've got yardage information, color, and thickness. And then I don't know what this other one is. Maybe it's a style number or something. And Aurifil, um, first of all, Aurifil color codes their spools. So orange spools like these two are both 50 weight. Um, wooden spools are either 80 weight or embroidery floss or a floss. Um, and so on this one, it says, you know, the 6726, that's the color number. Um, it says Aurifil Mako NE5020. So that's the name and type of the thread. And then the 50 is for the weight. It says made in Italy and it says 100 Cotone Mako. So 100% cotton. Um, I think this MT1300 might have to do with meterage, maybe GR is grams. But the important thing is, is that we have the color number. Uh, it's 50 weight by Aurifil, made in Italy, 100% cotton. So basic information is here to 1104, that's the color. Uh, Mako 50, that's so cotton 50, MT200, 200, 200 meters, I believe. I don't know what the 2MQ means. And then for the 80 weight, or this is 80 weight thread, so we've got the color number, MT280, that must be the meterage, and then 
here it does say 80. So I hope that's helpful. But yeah, lots of information on thread, lots of information on needles. Um, the important stuff you need to know is the weight and the color. And the important thing to know about the color is in case you run out and you need to get more of it, it's nice to know what color that is. Susanna asks, as a fabric designer yourself, how do you choose the fabrics you buy? And to that end, do you have advice about the amount to buy when you don't have a particular use or project in mind? Thanks, love your designs, best. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a really good question because um, I know walking into the store, it can be very overwhelming in a good way about all of the beautiful stuff and easy to want to buy all of it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure like some of you, I've, I mean, some of you can relate, like I have a huge stash, so I don't really need anything. I definitely have plenty that I can work with here, but there are always things that speak to me at the fabric store. So what is it that uh, allows me to make, make the purchase? Like, what do I add to my stash? That's a really good question. There are a few things that I like to consider. Um, one is just mainly like, what do I not have a lot of? Um, that's always something that I have in mind. And a good example recently is that I purchased some rayon, some Cloud9 rayon in this like really beautiful print. Um, and the reason for that is just that I've been making some dresses lately and I realized I don't have any rayon. <laughs> so that's a category that I don't have a lot of. So that made, it, made me much more inclined to buying some. Um, and generally with like, I mean with garment fabrics, that's when I buy more yardage. So you know, if I'm gonna make a dress or something that I wanna make sure I have enough of, then I'll get three yards. Um, otherwise, like I make a lot of shorts, you know, pants, tops. I have like a rough estimate, you know, in my mind about how much yardage I know I need for that. If you don't have a good estimate for that, then it's good to have, um, I love purchasing digital patterns for that reason is that I can pull them up on my phone and see what the yardage requirements are when I am in the fabric store. Otherwise, you can always go to a pattern designer's website and look at the pattern covers there. So um, that's a good way to figure out yardage for that kind of stuff. For quilting and stuff like that, where um, it's kind of a, an amorphous amount, uh, depending on what you're using that for, um, it just kind of depends. Like if I see a fabric and I'm like, oh, this would be an amazing background, or this would be an amazing, I don't know, be a really good backing, then yeah, obviously you would want a larger amount of yardage for that. Um, but if it's something that I could see just like throwing into my general stash, something that would be really pretty in patchwork for whatever reason, then I don't know, if the shop already has like fat quarters or half yard cuts or yard cuts, then that might make it easy for me to just like grab one of those. Um, if it's something that I have to get cut at the table, then yeah, I might be inclined to getting, I don't know, a half yard, something like that. To be honest, I don't, um, I don't know, quilting cotton, I have a lot of quilting cotton. So when I am buying quilting cotton, it's usually because it's perfect for a project, it's a color I don't have, or it's a designer that I really, really like. Um, because I'm, as you all know, like <laughs> fabric is not printed forever. Uh, so especially with some things, I know that I might wanna get a little bit of that because uh, it may, may not be around forever. So I'll pick up, I don't know, a little bit. So the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that that kind of mentality can really easily get you into like hoarding category where you just have like way too much fabric and it's overwhelming. Um, so one thing that's good to know is just that like that's the beauty of patchwork is that you don't need a lot of anything. Like you can put little bits of things into projects. So actually like pine and bow are really good examples where it doesn't take a lot of fabric for you know the applique or for one of the trees, but it's a really good way to capture a fabric that you really like. So um, even if you have just a little bit of it, then you know just know you can use it in a project. So don't feel like you have to get a lot of it. Um, so I do that a lot of times too, with like especially expensive fabric. So like Liberty of London, um, Little bits of that are fine. I have one ongoing project that maybe I can pop in here um, into the screen um, or I'm making Everglade blocks. And so for that one, I know I need at least like a 10 inch square um, for one block. So that way uh, I keep that in mind when I'm buying Liberty that I can at least get a 10 inch square out of that if I'm gonna incorporate it into that project. So it's kind of what I like to keep in mind with fabric is keeping in mind the things that I don't have very much of um, so the gaps in my stash, what I like to use it for. So if it's garments, kind of rough estimates on the yardage that you need for those different pieces. And then for patchwork, just keeping in mind that you don't have to 
have a lot of it to incorporate it into a project. So, but if you are buying for a project specifically, then yeah, you would you would want a certain amount for that. So, I hope that helps. Fabric buying is exciting, exhilarating, and uh, also overwhelming. So, yeah. Okay, Ruth asks, uh, what size binding do you cut? I usually cut a two and a half. Uh, sorry, I usually cut a two and a quarter inch binding. Um, I find that that works well for me. Um, my patterns are right two and a half. I think that gives you just the right amount of wiggle room. So the two and a quarter is just a little bit smaller, so it might be a little bit tighter um, if you've got a lot of layers, a really thick batting. But yeah, it's a very good question. All right, well, thank you so much for joining in. Um, I'd love to know what you've thought about the quilt along? Have you enjoyed these videos? Are there things that you want to see in the future? Um, I am enjoying put I enjoyed putting together the series, so I have ideas for what I want to do moving forward, but I'd love to hear um, what you're excited about too, so definitely leave comments below. Um, always keep in touch on my blog or by subscribing to this channel where I will be putting out any new videos, all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, following along and I will see you again soon.